All right. Well, welcome to Walnut Creek Church of God here in Mansfield, Texas. It's good to be here this morning. Amen. God is great. Yes, <laughs> God is great. It probably sounded like I was going to say something else, like God is great, God is good. Now we thank Him for our food. No, God is awesome and amazing, and we are His this morning. Hallelujah. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Amen? All right. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, our guest speaker this morning is, uh, as you all may, may have already guessed, is uh, Aaron Routon. And uh, we're looking forward, looking forward to the word that God has given him for us. Prepare your hearts and get them ready to receive. Uh, also, um, you've already experienced this, but our uh, Bible or our Sunday school class, uh, The Walk, resumed today. So every Sunday, amen, you can clap. And of course, every Sunday now, uh, henceforth, unless anything changes, uh, 9.30 on Sunday mornings. <clears throat> uh, June 10th will be uh, the Carlisle wedding reception and shower. Our pastor, uh, Austin, and his lovely wife, Julia, right? So June 10th, we'll have a reception and shower. That'll be here. All right. It is here. Uh, June 14th, our guest speaker is our uh, state overseer, Bishop Toby Morgan. Again, we've been encouraging you to come out to, that, to hear that and to experience that great, great message. Uh, June 21st is Mom and Dad Day. We're doing Mother's Day and Father's Day. You remember Pastor talked about that, that we missed, kinda, missed Mother's Day, so we're going to kind of do a joint Mother's Day, Father's Day thing. And that's June 21st. Read your bulletins and uh, all of that. So let's uh, open the word. I'm going to read a, verses, a few verses of scripture. It's going to be from Psalm, or the first Psalm, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, <clears throat> nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, his, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and wh whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Won't you stand with me and let's pray? An awesome crowd here this morning. If you're not here to see this, it's a great, great thing. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we praise you this morning for you are good and you are awesome. You're wonderful and you're more than enough for every situation. You're everywhere. You never change. You know everything and you have all power. And we trust you with everything we have. We are yours. Hallelujah. This morning, have your way in this place, Lord. We thank you for your presence here. Lord, we're trusting you for all kinds of miracles that may happen this morning. We're believing for those things. Salvations, healings, restorations, Lord, we're trusting you for that. And we're believing most of all for victory over the enemy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Did you come ready to worship the Lord this morning? He is the reason that we have come together and that we gather together. Let's worship him. You can clap your hands. We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up. 
up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brains. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing. magnify your name, Jesus. You are the King of Kings. He is the place we run to. He is our refuge and our fortress. Mighty God. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, 
relentless in his love for you and in his pursuit for you. He relentlessly pursues you. And you're never gonna let me, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down. Oh, never. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. Sing it again. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're. 
sing this ending with us. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. Can you just give him praise? Can you give him praise this morning? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your marvelous love. Thank you, God, for holding on to us. When we can't hold on, you hold on. Thank you, Jesus. Till I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so. Your goodness is running after its 
your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. worship him church just go ahead and love on the Lord a little bit this morning he's so precious Lord you are precious to us
God, I praise you. praise to you this morning. Hallelujah. You are wonderful, Lord. You are great and mighty, Lord. You are high and you are lifted up, Lord. There's none like you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Give him glory. Go ahead and continue to praise him. Continue yes, to worship. Lord, Hallelujah. We worship you, God. He's worthy of our praise. Thank you this morning. If you have any prayer requests, cards, please bring those forward this morning now. Hallelujah. My goodness, my goodness. Thank you, Lord. Healer, restorer. Our King. Just stretch your hands towards these requests. Oh, and before we do that, before we pray for these, let me, uh, I don't know if you want to put the pastor's picture up now or not, but uh, as many of you know, he's going to have back surgery tomorrow. And so we want to stretch our hands special right now before we pray for these. Uh, just you can stretch your hands toward the, the picture there and let's pray for our pastor. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are our God that heals us. And we thank you. And we thank you that by your stripes we were healed. Lord, we're believing that for our pastor, Pastor Kurt Routon, this morning. Lord, we're asking you to touch his back even before the surgery. Lord, we're asking for healing and restoration in his spine even now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as they open them up for surgery, Lord, you guide their hands. You guide every doctor, every nurse, every anesthesiologist, Lord, whoever is a part of this surgery. We're believing that you would guide them and direct them and that the surgery would be successful and that there would be a full recovery. Even if it's not now and before the surgery, we believe that that recovery will be so in the name of Jesus. Now let's stretch your hands towards these, these requests. Father, we know that you've already heard these. You know what these are. And we're just standing together with them. We're joining our faith with them that they would be healed, restored, delivered, that they would receive provision and guidance and direction. Lord, whatever the request is for a lost loved one, salvation, Father, we're believing for that. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it, and we believe that your promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to place these over at the Welcome Center, so please take one of these if you can uh, before you leave today. And again, we want you to drop in the box back there your praise reports, um, uh, because we want to hear... <laughs> We want to hear those as well. So uh, please do that because we want to rejoice with you and celebrate with you. Uh, there is, uh, just before we get to the offering, uh, there was an uprising of people who want to love on our pastor. And the, the goal was to show him before his surgery that we're thinking about him. Um, if he's watching, I know he already knows that. Uh, they were talking about want, wanting to drive by, you know, do a drive by shouting to the pastor. He hasn't, he doesn't have any way to see out uh, and it would be hard for him to get up right now. So the suggestion was that we could out in the parking lot do a video just showing him our love and let him know we're praying for him and that kind of thing. So we can do a video today. I don't know, uh, Alma Terrasis, if you want to um, did I say it wrong? Drake. Sorry. Wrong one. Anyway, raise your hand if you're the one. All right. So sorry. Uh, you can get with her and we can organize it because I think you were the, the spearhead of the idea. Amen? Amen. All right. It's time for the offering. Uh, we're going to have Bill come up and... and uh, Looks like he already did it. He'll collect them after we do the offering. Uh, if you have your offering together, you can gather that together and get your envelope ready. And uh, let's uh, begin to bring those forward. Hallelujah. Yeah, so here's a nice 
Austin and Julia's uh, wedding shower and reception, 7 to 8 p.m. on Wednesday the 10th, this Wednesday, in the Fellowship Hall. All my life you have been faithful. All right, Bill is going to gather these up and we're going to pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for what's been brought forth. Lord, we thank you for every seed that was sown. We believe that it'll produce for you and for the kingdom. Father, we believe that bodies will be set, healed, people will be saved. Such a, Buildings will be built. Missionaries will be provided for. We're trusting you and believing, believing you for the multiplication of this seed that's being sold. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a few minutes, Heather is going to come and sing for us this morning. And I'm looking forward to her ministering to us in song this morning. You guys look absolutely awesome this morning. Uh, I just want to give you a thank you guys. I know many of you have been praying for a pastor and have been texting and calling and checking on him. And, and I really, we really appreciate that. We appreciate your prayers. We appreciate all the love that we feel from our church family. We, we really feel that love. And uh, so I wanted to give you just a little update while you were all here. He is, he is in Baylor Hospital downtown. He's not able to see, have visitors because um, of the COVID-19 rules. Don't allow anybody but one person uh, per day and, that, and the same person. It can't be like at different times. It's like one person. And so that's me. <laughs> and so he, uh, he did on, on Wednesday, he got up about to go about his day like we normally go about a day, and he, uh, he sneezed, okay, like you know, anybody would sneeze, right? Uh, just an allergy sneeze, and uh, obviously he had, a l had, had a little, um, some arthritis maybe in his back, uh, up in the middle part of his back, and it came loose and went into his spinal column, and so uh, he became unable to stand and to, to on his two feet which was r really scary for us, uh, but um, he, we got him to the emergency room, and he was transported a couple of different times between hospitals and ended up downtown in, in Baylor, and the, we prayed, my, uh, we were all praying for him, and praying for right doctors, and praying for healing, praying for direction, and uh, I do want to testify that uh, he, when we got there, they gave him um, the doctor that my mother had greatly interceded for him to have. He is the chief of the neurosurgery department there at Baylor. And so I thank God because, you know, he, he lays out those things. He directs and guides. And, and we got a good diagnosis, and he's uh, going to, he's just having, they're trying to reduce the inflammation in his spinal column. He was in a lot of pain at first. He's not in any pain right now. And he's not having pain medication. So um, I as long as he just lays there, he doesn't have pain, so he's just laying there. So he can't, he doesn't get up. He did get up once, uh, day before yesterday, uh, but only once, and was back down. And they don't really want him up um, because uh, we're trying to reduce all inflammation and swelling, and we don't want any further damage in there. So s Monday afternoon, you can be in prayer. Uh, Monday morning, he's going in for a little procedure for him to mark it, and then Monday afternoon, he'll, they'll, he'll actually have the surgery. So keep him, continue to keep him in your prayers. Uh, the doctors expect it to go beautifully well and that he should be up and um, going in a few days and he'll have a few weeks of, of recovery time, but they expect him to have a full recovery. And so praise the Lord for that. Um, in everything, God is good. In everything, God is good. He shows his mercy. He shows his faithfulness. And uh, the Lord had given me a scripture out of Jeremiah. It's chapter 1. It's the last verse, but it says, The enemy will fight, but he will not prevail. He will not prevail. 
he has already lost, and he will not prevail in this, and uh, we will come through victorious. So thank you again for your prayers, and y'all worship with uh, Sister Heather as she comes to minister to us in song this morning. Amen. And I'm like Sister Gina. Y'all look so good this morning. I think this is the first time uh, that I actually have a microphone in my hand and people to sing to, and since probably February, and also it's so good to see y'all and all, and uh, and just know and all that God is good, like Sister Gina just shared, and everything. Um, you know, through everything that this world's been going through in 2020. This song has been on my mind so much because it's my testimony. And y'all have probably seen, even this week, I have been facing stuff that Satan has been trying to throw at me. And I went through two CT scans last week and all, got a good report and all, but we still need your prayers and all. I am on medication, so just pray that this medication will work and all. So I, I've been wondering, Sister Gina, what song I was going to be uh, to sing when I was, everybody was back. And I've been thinking of this song, like I said, through this whole time. But you know what? I didn't know I was going to dedicate it to somebody. And that somebody is Pastor Kirk this morning. And Pastor Kirk, I'm going to block them out right now, and I'm going to tell you, I am a miracle. As of this week, God still is a miracle worker. And what he's done for me, he can do it for you. Nothing is impossible this morning with God. I've been through the fire. You're going through the fire, but God's going to be with you through the fire. Amen. Are you glad you went through the fire? You're not in it, but you went through it. Amen. Not alone either. And so many times I've questioned certain circumstances at things I could not understand. How many of y'all's been there? And many times in trials, weakness blurs my vision, and my frustration gets so out of hand. Oh, but it's then I am reminded. I've never been forsaken. I never had to stand one test alone, Gina. And as I look at all the victories, the spirit, it rises up in me. And it's through the fire my weakness is made strong. Oh, 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 he never promised. That the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. And he never offered a victory without fighting, but he said help would always come in time. And just remember when you're standing but with the valley of decision. And the adversary says, give in, just hold on. And our Lord will show up, and he will take you through the fire again. Because I know within myself that I would surely perish. Oh, but if I trust the mighty hand of God, he's going to shield the flames again, again, and again. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. Lord, no, he never offered our victories without fighting, but he said help would always come in time. Pastor Kirk, just remember when you're standing with the valley of decision. And that the adversary says, give in, just hold on. 
and our Lord will show up and he will take you through the fire again. So just hold on and our Lord will show up and he'll take you through the fire again. Amen. Can somebody just thank God for his faithfulness this morning? He sees us through absolutely everything. Oh, man. God is good this morning. He is so good. And uh, I'm glad to be with you uh, this morning here at Walnut Creek Church of God. Ethan's going to come help me do uh, move something real quick. But um, under the circumstances, I don't like to be with you uh, because it means my dad's in the hospital. Uh, but I'm always happy to be here. Uh, thanks, Ethan. Everybody give Ethan a hand. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, don't feed to his ego. Um, but yeah, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, just keep Dad in your prayers. Um, I was with him yesterday. I got to take Mom's place. Uh, give her a break um, from uh, being up there. I can't type a password and talk at the same time. Uh, so, but he's doing well. Um, he is. He was encouraged yesterday. It's just if you've ever been in a hospital for uh, more than a day, it is just taxing on your mental state, on your physical state. It is not easy being in the hospital. So just keep him in your prayers. I know you are. Um, but I'm glad to be with you. I'm glad to be here uh, at Walnut Creek Church of God. I'm glad my pastor uh, let me get off this Sunday to come help my dad out. Uh, but, you know, the world is, is experiencing. Uh, are you tired of talking about all the stuff that's going on yet? Like, is anybody tired of just hearing this thing after the next thing? Uh, I'm so, it's exhausting. Uh, I mean, at this rate, if we keep going the way we're going, Cowboys will win the Super Bowl next February. And then the rapture will happen. I, I believe God is that much of a fan. He's just going to wait for that to happen and call us all home. That's the final thing. That's not in the Bible, but that's what I believe. But it seems like just impossible thing after impossible thing that is not of God keeps happening. And we get discouraged. We get frustrated. We get tired. But I don't want us to be naive this morning because the truth is it's bigger than a bacteria or a virus. It's bigger than a government or corrupt politicians. It's bigger than an unlawful murder. It's, it's bigger than that. There is an enemy of your soul and my soul that wants nothing more than to separate us further from God and to divide us as a people from standing together and serving that God. That's the goal of the enemy. It's division. He wants to cause so much chaos that our eyes are on the situation and the problem and an issue instead of God. He wants to fill our minds and our hearts with so much fear and anxiety that we're absent of the peace of God, that we're supposed to be walking in, and we're absent of that. That's what the enemy wants for you and me. He wants us to worry instead of trust. And I believe that during times like this, uh, it's, it's so simple. It really is simple if we can get our eyes off of the thing and get it off of the stuff and tune our ears off of the stuff and tune into God. It's that simple. And I was thinking about that past couple weeks, and this actually has been on my heart, and I didn't even know I was going to be here until, like, Friday, and uh, this this has been on my heart, and I'm just thinking, like, God, what do we, what do you say to people through all this? Like, how do you encourage somebody? How, how do you tell someone who's stricken with fear, right? Uh, I can't even go outside. I can't talk to people. I can't shake hands. I can't, you know, what do I tell them? How do I encourage somebody? How do I encourage somebody who's, you know, on the front lines of, of some kind of social crisis going on in America? Uh, how, do, how do you encourage that person? How do, you, how do you cross that barrier? 
And I don't know. God did not, I promise you, God did not reveal the answer to me. I wish he had. I would come out with something super profound and say, happy Christmas and goodbye, and there's your gift. But I don't have that answer. But as I was thinking of it, I was just thinking, what would comfort me? What, what, what comforts me? And for some reason, when I need uh, comfort, I go back to like my childhood because there, uh, there was peace there. I didn't have bills. I didn't have stress. I didn't have, uh, you know, responsibilities. And so I go back to, to things I was taught when I was small. And This song came to my mind. I don't, I don't know if you guys know it. I should have had Heather sing it. She could probably sing it better than me. But he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. There's, there's nothing profound or theologically uh, stimulating about that song. It's just the truth. He's got the whole world in his hands. And so this morning as we jump into this message and as we talk and as we social distance and all this stupid stuff that I'm tired of, can we just remember who's got it all under control? Can we pray together real quick? Father, we love you. God, we believe in you. We trust in you. God, and this is about you. So, Lord, these next few moments, this next little bit of time, God, we submit it to you. It's yours. You are in control. We honor you. Have your way in our hearts. Lord, have your way in our hearts. Holy Spirit, move on us. Bring peace. Bring comfort. Bring healing. Bring salvation today. Bring deliverance. For your people, this day, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if God has the whole world in his hands, you ever think about God's hands? You ever think about what they look like, what they feel like? Like what if you held God's hand? What if you shook God's hand? He'd probably crush it, right? <sighs> you know, you ever shaken a man and he doesn't, a man's hand, and he doesn't realize how strong he is, and he about breaks your knuckles when he shakes your hand, right? And then there's the other one that shakes your hand, and it's like they don't grab your hand. It's just like a cadaver, Right? There's, there's these, we shake hands, and my kids, I, that's one thing I love about being a dad, is my kids, especially my oldest one, she loves to just hold my hand. I don't have to ask her to. She just comes up, she grabs my hand, and that, as a dad, like that, I'll cry every time when that little six-year-old girl just comes up from behind me and grabs my hand and starts walking with me. Like, I hope she does that forever, all right? And one day, she'll try to hold a boy's hand, and I'll have to hide the body somewhere, but... We, we think about hands, and we use our hands for every, everything, and my kids always tell me, Dad, Daddy, you have rough hands. Your hands are scratchy. That's what they say. Your hands are scratchy. Uh, I have rough hands, but then there are other people who have calloused hands and broken hands. Like, you, you know, a mechanic's hands, you know if somebody's a mechanic when you meet them, right? Because they're, like, tattooed with grease all over. They're stained, right, permanently. Fingernails are always black. You know a mechanic. Right? And then there's the person who, who puts the lotion on, and they have cared for hands, right? They're soft hands. You know, we, we can look at hands, and when I think about hands, every, every hand is different. What is the hand of God like? What would it feel like? What would it look like after centuries upon centuries of dealing with our mess, of fixing our problems, of holding on to us, protecting us? shielding us, guarding us. You know, the Bible says that we're held in the hollow of his hand. He's got strong hands. What are God's hands like? Now, we can read the scripture and we can go through the Old Testament. And about 36 times in the Old Testament, you'll read the phrase, the hand of God was with them or the hand of God was before them or upon them. And you'll read it about three or four times in the New Testament too, about the hand of God went before them or was with them. But this morning, I would like to take just a few moments and talk about the hands of God, but not in the spiritual, supernatural, uh, miracle sort of way. I want us to look at when God's hands physically were seen and felt and on earth, right? Where, where there was a physical presence of God and his hand on the earth, right? It was literally, literally his hand was there. 
And maybe sometimes for us, especially right now, it seems like, where is God in all this? But I want to assure you that our God is a very hands-on God. He is very right here, right now, in all this motion. He did not leave us to just survive or fend for ourselves in the midst of all this. Our God, his hands are still in the midst of your situation today. So I want us to look at that, and it all starts at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, literally the beginning. In the beginning there was God, right? And God was there with all this, and he spoke, and there's light, and there's creation, right? And we read this story about creation, and it starts with his word, and he speaks things into existence. In the first half of Genesis chapter 1, God is speaking things into existence. He's speaking, and there is light, and he speaks, and the light and the darkness are divided, and he speaks, and the land is divided from the water, and God speaks, and he speaks, and he speaks. For five days worth of speaking, you can read about what he is speaking into existence and what he is separating and creating. But on the sixth day, God creates mankind. And God moves from this spoken creation to hands-on building, molding, forming us, humanity. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says that God formed man. He formed him. He didn't speak him into existence. He formed him out of the dust of the ground. He breathed breath into his nostrils, the breath of life, and the man became a living being. God did not choose to speak you into existence. He chose to create you. You read further on in the Bible, It talks about in Jeremiah how you were knit together in your mother's womb. That God fashioned you. That God created you. So in the beginning, God created you and I, humanity, out of the dust of the earth. He got down in the dirt. He got his hands dirty. And he made it. The the Hebrew word there is actually mud. Right? He gets in this mud and this clay and he forms mankind. You know what that says to me? That a dog, he can say, let there be a dog, and there is a dog, right? God has that power. But for you and I, he wanted something that he cared for a little more. I'm not saying God doesn't care about your dog, okay? But he has a genuine care and concern for you as a person because he has crafted you with his hands. When I make something... It may not be very good, but I made it, right? I made it. I created that. And so it, it, my art or whatever it is, you know, it may not look good to you, but to me, it's beautiful. It's my creation. It's something that I took my time and my energy and my effort and my thoughts, and I sank it all into this thing, and I made it. And that's what God has done with you. He may have taken the first five days to speak a whole lot into creation, but on the sixth day, he took his own time, and he created you, and he fashioned you with his hands, his hands in the mud and the dirt. And he took his time to put his mouth over the nostrils of mankind, and he breathed life into it. Everything else he spoke, and it just started being. But with you and I, he put life in you. He put something special in you. God created you with a purpose and a plan. The creator of the universe. The guy, the God whose whose hand spans the universe. And the Bible says the earth is his footstool. It's beyond comprehension. Yet he chose to come down and build you and I. And breathe into us. And from the beginning, his hands were on the earth. And that creator, that powerful God who's able to do all that is still that same God today. He's still that powerful. He's still that good. He's still that loving. And he still cares for you and I just the same. He took his time and energy to do it. But in the next chapter, chapter 3, this is where we would take the perfection of his creation, that holy, perfect thing that God could now spend time with. The Bible says that God would continue after he created Adam and Eve. He would come down and walk with them in the garden. He would spend time with them. God himself would come to earth and he would be here with people talking 
exchanging conversation, having relationship. But in chapter 3 of Genesis, we would take the beauty of his creation, we would mess it all up. We would sin against God. We would make a choice that would forever affect the course of humanity. We did it. We made perfection imperfect. We took the mud and the clay that he formed and made beautiful, and he looked at it and said, I like this. This is a good thing. And we took it and marred it. We broke it. We chipped it. We scarred it. God's creation is now imperfect. That holy thing, that pure thing, that perfect thing that God created isn't that way anymore. It's not the same. And so because of that choice, because of what we did, the choice that we made, the choice that humanity made, because of that sin, God would no longer be able to physically place himself in the midst of humanity because holy God couldn't interact with what is now sinful humanity. It's not the same anymore. One time I got my mom a teacup for her birthday. Somebody wanted to play with the dog in the house, and they threw a ball. And that teacup got smashed, broke the handle. Well, mom cherished my teacup that I bought her, so it was super glued back on. Here's this teacup. You still want to use it. You still want to display it, right? It's pretty. The problem is that teacup was now broken, and that perfect little thing, was not the same. And so then somebody tried to pick it up by the handle, and guess what happened? Chink. There goes the rest of the teacup. We're still humanity. We're still God's creation, but we are not the same. We are broken. And we are in need of repair. And so we had taken our hands on God and separated ourselves from him, and his hands could no longer touch and be in creation. His, his fellowship with us was now broken, and our God, who wanted nothing more than to share creation and eternity with us, was now separate because of what we did. But he would not be content to leave it that way. So from that point on, God would begin working this way through humanity. And you read the Bible, right? It's this giant interwoven story about how God is continually pursuing us and trying to win us back to trying to repair what we have broken, the relationship that we messed up. God is continually, throughout the Bible, trying to repair that. And at the epicenter of that was sin, right? Sin. I'm going to say it, sin. Okay, that makes some people uncomfortable to say that, all right? But sin, it's in the human heart. It's part of us now. It's our nature now. Brokenness is our nature. After that point, we're broken from that point on. We're all sinful from that point on. And we had given in to what we wanted over what God wanted. And that's been our problem since then. I would challenge you to look at any issue in your life, in the world, in your family, at your job. Look at all the issues that bring you trouble, bring you difficulty. And at the center of all those issues is someone who is caught up in themselves, who is self-centered, selfish, thinking of what I want over the needs of someone else or over God. Look at it. I promise you. In every situation, that's the epicenter of it, is what I want over what someone else wants. Someone who thinks they have the answer or they don't need help. And it causes sin to grow. The Bible talks about in James how it's sin grows and sin is birthed and that death happens all because you, because of your desires, are drawn away and enticed. That's in the book of James. It says it starts in here. It starts with what I want. And that's what gives birth to sin. That sin causes greater separation and division between us and God. So if you're struggling this morning, if there's something going on, look at yourself. Evaluate yourself. Evaluate what's going on before you look at your wife or, or your husband and say, you have a problem. Look at yourself. Because I guarantee you're 50% of that problem. It's never 100 and 0. It's always 50-50. And so because of that problem, because of that sin, because of that issue, because I'm a problem, right, there had to be something that uh, justified that. There had to be uh, uh, repercussions for that mistake, for that sin that you and I all have in our lives. There has to be some form of judgment, right, or punishment for that. And so that has to happen, but God doesn't want that to happen. 
But it has to happen because that's the way things work. That's scary to think about. You think about a God who's that big, who can speak things in and out of, ex of existence, and that same God has to judge you. He's got to look at you and say, okay, let's talk about sin, right? Let's talk about your issues. That's kind of scary. What if God looked at me and revealed all my mess and then had to judge me for all my mess? I'd be in trouble, y'all. I'm a good guy, but... <laughs> I mean, I'm not perfect. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you. But in Daniel chapter 5, we skip forward, right? We go through most of the Old Testament. We get to Daniel. He's a prophet. They're captive in Babylon. And in Daniel chapter 5, we see King Belshazzar. And this guy, he's like the grandson, great-grandson, whatever, of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. And they're having a party. They're living it up. The kingdom is doing great. He has a thousand of his rulers and lords over to his house. And they're like, they're drinking, they're partying, they're eating this food. They're having a good time. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, on the wall appears something that we haven't seen in quite a long time. It's a hand. Just a hand of God on the wall. And the Bible says that that hand carved and wrote on the plaster of the wall. Daniel chapter 5, verse 5 says, In the same hour the fingers of the hand appeared and wrote opposite of the lampstand on the plaster of the wall in the king's palace, and the king saw the hand that wrote. And then the king's countenance changed. His thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. This dude was about to faint because he saw the hand of God writing on the wall. The Bible says there were over a thousand people there. They saw this happen. And what that writing was, was judgment. Because Belshazzar had lived in a time where God had called Nebuchadnezzar to live for him. And he turned his life over to him. He, he started living right. And so this guy knew how they were supposed to live. He knew who the true God was, but he chose to exalt these false pagan gods. He chose to live in himself. He chose to exalt himself, himself. Hear that? Self. He exalted himself. He was depending on himself. He was having people praise himself. And so God had to cast judgment. The Bible says that right then, that very night, that judgment was cast upon uh, Babylon, and the, the kingdom was overthrown. It says the Persians overtook it, and they were no more. New kingdom, new authority. Because the hand of judgment of God was upon them. And that's scary. Because that has to happen. It's the law. It's the Bible. It's the way things work. That when there's something wrong, there has to be payment for that sin. And God was poised to judge. And he's even put it in his word. And so we go on, right? And Israel is passed from kingdom to kingdom in the Old Testament. And they go on. They're, they're in captivity time after time after time. And then one day, one day there's just silence. God's voice, his presence, his hands, they're withdrawn from the earth. And at the end of the Old Testament, you'll read that there was silence for over 400 years. There were no prophets. Could you imagine what it would be like, what, it's, what it would be like in a world where there were no preachers on the Internet or on TV, right? Or, or it, the, the churches aren't open because the men of God aren't hearing from God. The voice of God wasn't speaking. There was nothing. For all that time, for over 400 years, they only had one thing to rely on, and that was what was written the words of God that had been spoken through prophets. And that was all that they had to lean on. Those who were left to serve God, those who were still faithful to the name of God, those who still wanted relationship, they didn't have anybody coming to their temples and speaking. They didn't have anybody giving them a prophetic word or praying for them in that way. All they had were the words of the prophets that had been spoken throughout the ages. The faithful people. All they had to hold on to were the words of Isaiah. 
where he says in like verse uh, chapter 28, verse 16, Therefore says the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Or what Isaiah said in chapter 53, 5, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. They were holding on to the words of Micah 5, 2 through 5, or Psalm 16, 1 through 11, prophecies about one who would come in the name of the Lord and set them free. That's all they had to hold on to. All they had to hold on to was the word of God, the promises that God had made throughout the centuries. The word of God is so important in the midst of our chaos. Some days you're going to wake up, and the world is going to be caving in. Some days you're going to wake up and you're already going to be fighting with somebody that you don't want to fight with. Some days you're going to go to work and you're just not going to want to be there. You're going to be miserable. Some days you're going to feel like there's no way I can write this check to pay my bills. Some days you're going to feel like you're so consumed with a sin or an emotion that you can't get out of it. And you'll feel like, where is God? Where is God's hand in this? Where is his presence in this? And in that moment, you have to remember that what you have to hold on to is the word of God. Now, for them, it was different. For them, it was on a scroll, right? And had these scrolls in the temple, and only certain ones could open the scroll and read from the scroll, and you had to go and you had to listen to the priests read the scroll. That was the way it worked. It was like the equivalent of the only way you can read the Bible is if you come to church on Sunday and let me read what I choose to read to you. They didn't have the luxury of having one that they never open on their nightstand. Where are you at? Right? (laughs) And they never had the, the opportunity to have a decorative scroll on their coffee table. Right? Those weren't luxuries that they had. They had to go and be fed the word. You have a different luxury. You can open this phone right here, and anytime you want, you can hold on to the words of God because there's an app for that. And anytime you want, you can open up this thing, whether you're at work, whether you're at home. Did you know you can shut Netflix off? Did you know that? Did you know you don't have, if you don't watch Netflix right now, you're not going to miss your show. It's still going to be there later. And you can pause it, and you can stop it, and you can turn it off and get into the Word of God. That is very possible, and you have that luxury. And so what they didn't have but you have is the opportunity to get into that Word in a different way and to hear that Word in a different way. You see, this is why. Because in the beginning, there was the Word. And that Word was with God, and that Word was God, right? And He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, this Word. And without him, nothing was made that was made, and in him was life, and that life was the light to men, and that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can't comprehend it. And that word that was at the beginning that spoke, and there was light, and that spoke, and there was this, and that spoke, and there was that, that word that created and brought life to you and me, that word that was there, that word became flesh. That word that was in the prophecy of Isaiah and Micah and David and Jeremiah became flesh and dwelt among men. And they beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He walked the earth. His name was Jesus. And that word was now on earth. And for the first time in a long time, the God of creation who walked with men at one time, was now walking with us again. The problem is we didn't see it. The problem is they didn't see it at the time. Here's the cool thing. In John chapter 8, we see Jesus, and he's going to the temple to preach. And uh, there are religious rulers and leaders and uh, authorities. And they come in, and they're, they're dragging this woman And this woman had been caught in this sinful lifestyle, adultery, right? She'd been caught. Now, according to the law, the way the law worked, this woman, uh, because of her adulterous lifestyle and her sin, uh, she should have been stoned on the spot. She should have been killed, judged immediately because she was caught. Anybody ever been caught? That woman right over there could tell you some stories about how many times I've been caught. Uh, 
but in John chapter 8, we see Jesus, and this woman is thrown in front of him, and she's caught in adultery, and I can just see her kind of laying there, ashamed, her sin exposed, her life exposed. Who knows where she had been, what she smelled like, what she looked like, how she was dressed. Because she was caught in the act. And there she is in front of crowds, multitudes. And here's this prophet, this, this Messiah, Jesus, right? I said, what do you want to do with her? The law says, the law of Moses says that we should stone her right here. She should be put to death. Jesus, I... I like it because sometimes when you read the Bible, Jesus kind of comes off a little sarcastic sometimes, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that's how it was, but that's how it comes off when I read it. Maybe I'm judging him. That's wrong. But Jesus says, this is, what do you want us to do with her? Stone her. We should stone her. And Jesus doesn't say a word. He just kneels down in front of her. This is a bucket of dirt, by the way. He kneels down in front of her, and the Bible says he just puts his hand in the dirt. And he kind of draws in the dirt, and he writes. Who knows? We could argue all day about what he wrote. The Bible doesn't say what he wrote. But he puts his hand in the dirt. The Bible says while he's, he's drawn in the dirt, while he's, this 30-year-old man is playing in the dirt in front of a woman who's supposed to be stoned, the religious leaders continue to yell. They continue to... What do you want us to do? They continue to press him. What, do you, what should be done? Jesus draws in dirt a little more. I wonder what he was thinking. I wonder what he thought as he, he took up that hand of dirt. Is he true in it? Now, this is the gospel of Aaron. This isn't the Bible, but I wonder if he was saying, it's been a while. It's been a while since I've created something new. It's been a while since I've had my hands in this stuff. It's been a while since I've walked and talked and felt. The Bible says Jesus stood up. And as he stood up, he looked at the leaders and he said, okay, if we should stone her, whoever, whichever one of you is without sin, go ahead and you throw the first stone. Go right ahead. The Bible says Jesus knelt back down and in the dirt again. And I wonder if what Jesus was thinking in that moment is that you may be broken, sis, you may be, you may be hurting. But my hands can make you a new creation today. But my hands can repair the brokenness. And what she didn't know right then in that moment was that not much later, that that very hand that was in the dirt and the very voice that would say to her, where are your accusers? And she says, I don't know, they've gone. And he says, good, go and sin no more. That voice and those hands, what she didn't know and what the people didn't know was that hand that held that dirt and made that creation would be broken. So that she didn't have to stay broken. What she didn't know is that that man's side would be broken and pierced and scarred because he didn't want your heart to be broken anymore. So he was broken for that. I'm glad we got kids. I got baby wipes. I wonder if when he put his hand in that dirt that he was thinking about the words that Paul would write inspired by the Lord. That there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, what Jesus told her was, he said, if they're not here to condemn you, I don't condemn you either. Go your own way. Go do your own thing. And sin no more. He was here. And he was the word. And the word put his hands in the dirt. And the word hung on the cross, and he was broken, and his body was dirty. For you and I.
so your hands don't have to be dirty anymore. So now you can pray a prayer that says, Lord, give me clean hands and a pure heart. And when you pray that prayer, the blood of Jesus washes over you. And you're not that sinful, covered in dirt and sin person anymore because there was a Savior who dug his hands into the earth and made you a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Behold, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old things are gone and the new things have come. And we understand that we're all sinners. We're all the woman. We're all the woman. Sometimes we're the judging leaders, but we're all the woman. We're all sinful. And if there was one who had the right to judge, only one was Jesus because he was the only one who could uphold the law because he fulfilled it all. But the creator put his hands back in this dirt. He put his feet to this earth. And he put his hands and his back to a tree willingly in obedience to God for us. And so now Jesus stands risen. And that broken body, the Bible says he's, he bears the scars of that, right? After that, he, he returned, after he rose from the grave, the Bible says that the disciples touched his hands and his side where he was broken for you and me. And when Jesus did, died on that cross, he didn't just get his hands dirty. He took on the filth of the world. And he carried all your dirt and my dirt so he could make us clean. He paid the price for us so that God's hand of judgment doesn't have to fall on us, but so that God's hand of grace can hold us. That's what we need to know today. That this morning, if you walked in here covered in the filth of the world, if this morning you're like that woman that you walk in and I'm worthless and I'm dirty and I am a sinner and I have made mistakes and I've been caught, there is a Jesus who stands before you and will look at you and say, I don't condemn you. I forgive you and I give you grace this morning. If you walked in here this morning, you may actually be in adultery. You may be full of anger or bitterness, fighting fear, uncontrolled anxiety or depression, hooked on pornography or a substance, caught in a prideful, selfish lifestyle filled with shame and regret, but you can bring it right here. You can fall at his feet where you'll meet a Savior who does not hate or condemn but one who kneels beside you and is willing to hold the dirt that you brought in, is willing to hold all the junk that you've been carrying that you shouldn't be carrying, he'll hold it for you because he's already carried it on the cross for you. The creator is here and he's full of grace and he's full of mercy. And you can be a new creation today. The old things can be gone and the new can come right now, this morning. I want you to know that his hands are in the midst of your situation. Would you guys bow your heads with me? I just want to give you an opportunity. If there's anyone in here who really identifies with uh, the fact that I feel, I, feel like, I feel like I'm a sinner this morning. I feel like I've made mistakes and I need the forgiveness of God. I need Jesus to give me grace. And have mercy on me. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up real quick? Nobody's looking around. Yeah, awesome. Listen, God forgives you today. You can put your hands back down. He forgives you. He loves you. And I want you to know that there is nothing that Jesus can't undo. He was broken for you. He was pierced for your transgressions. And he wears the scars on his body that prove it. If that's you this morning, I would just add, invite you where you are just to say, Jesus, forgive me. I believe in you. And I commit my life to you. I want to be free from sin. And I want to live for you, Jesus, in your freedom and in your joy and in your grace, God. Now, secondly, if you walked in here and you're just dealing with, if life is hitting you hard and you need the hands of Jesus, the hands of God to intervene in your situation, whatever it is. 
whether it's for salvation or sickness or a situation that nobody else knows about. I would just invite you to lift your hand as a show of faith. Just say, God, I need you right now in my situation. Yeah, this is just, this isn't you committing to anything or joining a church. This is you just saying, God, I believe you and your mighty hands aren't short to save, that your hands are powerful enough to hold me in the hollow of your hand. And I don't have to worry. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to live in fear because I serve a God who is greater than my situation, who has overcome the world. And we have no fear this morning. I want to pray for you guys. Father, we love you. God, we appreciate you. God, we thank you so much that you were willing to undo what we could not undo. Jesus, that you were willing to take on the filth, to become sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Thank you for doing that, Jesus. Thank you for taking on our filth and our brokenness. Thank you for bearing our sickness. Thank you for bearing our punishment. Thank you for bearing our freedom. Freedom from substance. Freedom from addiction. Freedom from bondage of sin. Freedom from depression. Freedom from anxiety. You give us that, Jesus, and we're so grateful for that. So this morning... Lord, for those who are in this place who are bound, for those who are in this place that are struggling and fighting, for those who are just barely holding on, God, that you are walking with us, that through the midst of that fire, through the midst of that storm, you are walking right beside us. Hold us, Jesus, in the palm of your hand. Deliver us. Give us freedom this morning. And let your mighty hand take hold of every situation. And change it for your good this morning. Father, we love you. God, we praise you for your goodness and for your grace. Have your way in our hearts this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, his hands are holding you this week. Um, Thank you, Um, Pastor Aaron. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, everyone who has been here this morning. God is good, isn't he? Aren't you thankful that his righteous right arm is never too short? It is never too short. That was uh, one of the scriptures that I love to uh, read and remind myself of. So many times, specifically when I uh, was recovering from cancer, I would be reminded, I don't have to walk in fear today because Daddy's hand, his righteous right arm, my Father God, it's not too short to keep me. And uh, I was reminded of Job chapter 33 and 4. It says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. And that's who I am. And that's who you are this morning. And you can rest in that identity knowing that's who, you, that's who created you, who made you, who you belong to. If you've surrendered your life to them, him, he owns the rights to you. And the enemy cannot swoop in and take you. He may fight, but he will not prevail. Um, This morning as we dismiss, (coughs) I'm going to dismiss us in prayer. And as we dismiss, we're going to continue to uh, use our social distancing practices. So we're going to do it a little different. Uh, We've been all going out this exit by sections. This today, we're going to have these sections over here are going to go out this door. These sections over here are going to go out that door. But we will do it by sections. uh, So be patient as we exit the building. Heavenly Father, I just thank you this morning for your awesome presence in this service from start to finish. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit. We thank you for your breath in us. We thank you, God, that you give us life and life abundant. We thank you, Father God. We thank you, Jesus, that your righteous right arm is never too short. 
And we give you glory and honor. And I pray that you will go with my brothers and sisters today as they exit the church. I pray that you will be with them, strengthen them, keep them throughout the week, and bring them back safely next Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we'll start over here.